Everybody stand and worship with us this morning. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. We are talking about the light of the world today in our series on the seven I am statements of Christ with a predicate, you know, I am the something. And uh, we're talking about bedrock or blasphemy. Is, is this the foundation of our life or was Jesus wrong? Pretty important question uh, to answer. I think you know what side uh, we come down on, but uh, I think it's very important for us uh, to understand in uh, Psalm 27 1 it speaks of the light the study of light and darkness in the Bible is is kind of fascinating we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today but in uh, Psalm 27 1 it says the Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear now we live in, in a time in which you know fear is all around us isn't it you know it's not the first time you know, it's kind of interesting, they, they kind of talk like this is the first time some of these things have uh, uh, grasped us. My wife and I this week uh, were married 38 years, so you can um, send her a <laughs> condolence card. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we were married 38 years. We got married in 1982. 
Uh, if you know anything about that, they'll talk about 2020 or something, or even when it happened in 2008, there was a crash. And they'll say, this is the worst since 1982. You know, we didn't know anything. We just got married. You know what I mean? We didn't know anything. Um, if, if I remember correctly, interest rates were like 20%. I mean, it was, all this stuff was terrible. We just loved each other, you know, and we looked at each other. And I did a wedding yesterday, and I looked at them, and they had that light in their eyes. And, you know, as wonderful as that is, that goes away. People die, you know. Marriages end with death. And, and we look at it, and we say, but our relationship with Christ never does. And we can look, and we can realize that the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? We don't have to fear anyone. The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And the answer really is no one. And as we gather together, we have the answer to the world's problems. Through all of the darkness, you know, um, I was raised 40 miles from Kenosha. So, and we used to stop there all the time, uh, going in and coming out of Milwaukee. And, you know, it's, it's sad to see that. I was even involved in a church dedication once in, in Kenosha. And you look at that and you go, wow, that terrible darkness. But there's an answer, and his name is Jesus. Father, we just pray today that as uh, we look at the light of the world, Jesus, that we would realize, Lord, that you are light and in you is no darkness at all, and we need to shine like stars in a dark universe. In Jesus' name, and all of his children said, amen, amen. Let's continue to worship. you're looking for. Bring all 
your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. Well, you look wonderful. Thank you. And uh, had a great wedding last night. Some of you know Emily Whiteleather and uh, Race Binion. They became Mr. and Mrs. Binion uh, last night at uh, Cerruti's. And so uh, I'm doing my best. I was out way past my bedtime. So uh, I'm doing my best here. And I see a couple people aren't here. I think they were uh, made uh, or uh, best man and matron of honor. So I think they're a little tired too. So, uh, but it's a good week. We want to uh, uh, remember today um, the uh, Caribbean and uh, the difficulties there with Hurricane Laura. And so we want to remember that, especially in our prayers, both the English-speaking Caribbean and the, the uh, uh, French-speaking, French and Creole-speaking uh, Caribbean. At this time, if you want to wave at each other, we'll do our wave offering, okay? We can't greet always the way that we did. And if you need to put your offering in, uh, you can wave that, too, as you put it in. That's fine with me. Just a couple of things uh, today. If our children would gather to the center, it's the fifth Sunday. And so if you need to take your children back, there will be um, some uh, teachers that will take you back, too. And uh, it was nice to have a young one helping lead us in worship, wasn't it? Summer? Amen. And... Um, they will be going back. We're going to bless them here. Um, and if you need to go back with them and get them settled, um, we welcome you today. I know that there are some visiting with us today. We hope you're not visitors long. We hope you're part of our family. And um, we want you to fill out a welcome card that's in your seat back. But if you need to take the children back, that would be fine. And you can pick them up the place that you uh, drop them off. They are also going to meet their new teachers today. So teachers, if you're teaching sometime in this next quarter, you can go back as well. They'll introduce you. And then you're welcome to come back into the service. And then next week we have um, uh, Miami Village, and uh, we'll be ministering there. There won't be a service here next week. It will be at Miami Village at 11, and you can come early and help set up and that kind of thing. And then um, uh, the 13th, they will be meeting with their new teachers, so this gives them a chance to uh, meet, their, meet their teachers. Um, so that is uh, that's, uh, wonderful. So, uh, Zach, I would, you were once a kid like this. Never? You were born at 30? Yeah. You're not even 30, are you? Yeah. Would you reach out your hands and bless our children as they go to their time together? Amen. 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 And so you can go, get them settled, come back. That's great. All righty. You think that's great? All right. Well, you may be seated. I do want to uh, say sometimes I mention things um, about our uh, community. And um, the Columbia City Eagles are now undefeated. How about that, huh? And they won 28 to 7. I know there was a young fellow in our uh, congregation uh, this morning, um, Landon Markins. And I know uh, there are others uh, around. I don't see other football players. I know uh, there's a young fellow in the Tucker family and then also uh, Tavian um, uh, Foster as well. So this is kind of, kind of exciting to, to see. There's some difficult things, but there's uh, some good things too uh, that are coming in our uh, in this uh, in this year um, again um, we're going to have prayer and then as we sing our first song if folks uh, want to come forward and uh, and pray we're especially praying for Miami Village next week as well as uh, the Caribbean and the needs that are there um, because of the uh, the Hurricane Laura that went uh, that went through um, I have resisted um, I know several Lauras, and I have resisted the uh, uh, temptation, you know, to say, why did you do that, you know? But uh, that's good. Let's look to the Lord. Father in heaven, we come into your presence uh, today, and we're thankful, Lord, 
uh, for what you're doing uh, in, our, in our midst. Uh, we pray, Father, uh, for uh, those that have been affected by Hurricane Laura, both in our country, Louisiana and Texas. Pray, Father, for those that are still recovering in southern Iowa from the windstorms of a couple of weeks ago and losing all that corn and buildings and all that kind of thing. And uh, Pam and I have a lot of friends down there, and we, we ask your special touch uh, on them. We pray for those that came through surgery. We think of Carissa Cox, and we ask, Lord, you continue to help her as she had this uh, leg operation, uh, Lord. Um, and we, we pray, Father, for her chronic brain injury, a traumatic brain injury as well as she had a couple years ago. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that um, they were able then to, to do a little reparative work on her, uh, on her leg as well. Um, we pray, Father, uh, for Sharon Stefanski, who normally is here and uh, had, um, had some facial surgery and a, and a cyst removed over her eye and is very swollen, and we pray for her. We pray, Father, for um, those families, especially the Ball family, but others as well that were affected by the Crosby uh, tragedy in the, um, in the construction uh, um, on, on Main Street there or off, just off Main Street, and we ask your special uh, touch. We pray, Father, for those that are undergoing uh, treatments uh, as well. Uh, Lord, we think of uh, those having uh, cancer treatments. We think of uh, Sherry Johnson, and we ask your uh, touch uh, on her as, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as others. We pray, Father, um, uh, and thank you for, for the way that you're working in, in people's lives. We think, Father, of those in drug rehab, those who are uh, getting over addictions, and we pray especially, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit and the light uh, to come into their life. Uh, Lord, we think of uh, Judy Dembski, and we're thankful she's here today. And we're thankful, Lord, she's doing better after a, a fall. Um, we think, Father, of uh, Chelsea Smith, and just ask, Lord, that you continue uh, to help her with all of her uh, needs. Um, we pray for those that are expecting, for Kelsey and Carol and Mary and Shana and Cheyenne. We pray, Father, for the darkness in our country right now and we pray for our leaders lord federal state and local we pray for our president our vice president our state federal and local officials and we ask lord that you give them wisdom and most of all lord that they would look to you that they would know that some of these problems are beyond their scope and beyond their power to help we pray father uh, for missions uh, all over the world and uh, i do think father of the caribbean i think of the french speaking part that we minister in i think of my daughter and son-in-law's uh, church, the Churches of Christ and Christian Union, that minister a lot in the English-speaking part of, uh, uh, of the Caribbean, uh, Lord, um, many of those small islands, and we, we pray for them, Lord, and we ask that you'd help them. Pray for uh, a pastor in Puerto Rico that uh, James has worked with, Pastor Enrique, whose son passed away this last week, and uh, we don't know a lot of the details, but we pray uh, for them. Pray for uh, Peru, uh, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and uh, other countries in which we work. We pray, Father, again, for um, a spiritual uh, solution to many of the problems we have. We think of uh, the prayer march that's going to go on, I believe, next Wednesday uh, on the uh, mall uh, in Washington uh, as well. And uh, again, Father, we're thankful uh, for what you've done for us, and uh, we ask that you would uh, continue uh, to help us to be the light of the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, for the offering today. We ask that you take it, break it, and use it to the uttermost part of the world, whether it's uh, helping folks, Lord, who, whose families have difficulties, like with our playground and other things, or whether it's far across uh, the globe uh, in places like Kenya, India, and Bangladesh. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us long arms uh, through your children. In Jesus' name, and all of his children said, Amen, amen. The altar is open. The last few weeks, I felt the Lord impress this song upon my heart, and every time I would hear it, I would feel um, him say, you need to do this song. There are people that need to hear this song. And many of you have probably heard it, but um, the more people I talk to, it just, I can tell um, it is what people need to hear and can resonate with almost everyone right now. So it's called Sea of Victory. So stand and join us as we sing.
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the Thank you. 
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. to have our Facebook Live friends uh, with us, and that's always wonderful uh, to have and uh, to know that folks are joining us. So we're excited. Folks are coming back, but we've uh, kind of gotten a whole new congregation, which is uh, really kind of, uh, kind of exciting. So uh, Brother Dan, I see you back there. Could you project your voice and ask the Lord's blessing on his word?
Pastor Matt. Thank you very much. It is interesting and uh, almost embarrassing sometimes to uh, drive through small towns and sometimes your own town um, and see those kind of grayish blue signs that give you a historical perspective on where you live or on the town that you're driving through. And, um, you know, uh, I know that some people have commented to me that uh, sometimes they have been involved in a traffic jam, especially like with a funeral or something, and they've been made to stop on Main Street or one of the side streets. And they'll stop in front of one of these signs, and they'll finally read it. They've lived here their whole life. And they realize that one of the early vice presidents came from Columbia City, and they say, I never knew that. And I've lived here my whole life. And, you know, um, there are other little towns. Now, I'm a historian, so those things kind of... Um, they kind of intrigue me. But at the same time, I grew up in Milwaukee for all of those years, and there were times I would come home and somebody would say something or somebody would visit there uh, from where I was living and say, hey, I visited Milwaukee, and I didn't know, and they would tell me a fact that I didn't know either. But I could have known if I had wanted to. My wife and I, uh, through the years, have always found little places uh, to get away. And if you uh, look at your um, bulletin this morning on the front of it is the Wabash Courthouse. Now, I want you to know something. I think that the Columbia City Courthouse is probably one of the prettiest courthouses in the nation. I've been around a long time, and I've been a lot of places, and I think it's one of the most beautiful ones. Every now and then you'll see an architecture student from one of the colleges uh, doing a sketch of our courthouse um, because it's one of their assignments to do something like that. Uh, but you know, Wabash isn't bad. You hear me, John? Up there, he's from what? Wabash isn't bad. You know, it's in there. It's up in the in the upper uh, tiers. But if you have ever been to Wabash, my wife and I like to go away to Wabash. Somebody said, "Why would you go to Wabash?" Well, because it's not here, right? You know, someplace a little different. Um, but I remember being in Wabash, and it was probably the fourth or fifth time that I was there that I noticed a sign that said, Wabash, Indiana, the first electrically lighted city in the United States. That's pretty significant. How many of you knew that? How many of you didn't know? Wait, we won't make it. No, we won't do that. Um, was interesting, sometimes a seemingly insignificant event can change history. The birth of Jesus, the light coming into the world, it changes all of history. But at the time, it seemed like a very insignificant event. On March 31st, 1880, they took four 3,000 candle lamps and put them at the, uh, the, the higher parts of the courthouse. They then ran lines down to a steam engine in the basement of the courthouse, a steam engine. Now, the interesting thing was this was on March 31st, 1880. It was originally scheduled for April 1st, but they thought if it failed that they would forever be known as the April Fool City. So they decided to do it on the 31st in case something went wrong, they could fix it and get it right on the 1st. But everything went right. The city at sundown, at sunset, looked like the sun was shining. Within just a few months, they had put up street lights. Now, before that, they had a gas light tender. And he would go around and light these gas lights. And, I mean, it was a... It was a uh, a very labor-intensive um, operation to do that, to just light up uh, the downtown. But as you see there, there's a historical display of one of the first electric lights that was in Wabash. And they would just turn on a central power source from a municipal building, and the whole city would light up. Now, within 40 years, every major city and many smaller cities like, like uh, Wabash and others would have electric lighting all over their city. And it became commonplace in America. 
In John 1, 1 to 9, we see that Jesus comes to bring light into our world. It says in John 1, 3, through him, all things were made. With him, without him, nothing was made that was made, and in him was life, and that life gives light to humankind, to men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness hasn't understood it. Now, that's very true. Most of the world doesn't understand that their problems could be solved in Jesus. We have all of these riots going on in our, in our country, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We're really good at pointing out what the problems are. We really are bad at figuring out what the solutions are because light needs to come on. And our world hasn't understood light. Now, the other thing about this word understood, it can also be interpreted or, or translated as overcome. And that makes a lot of sense, too. Because no matter what people do in our world, they can't overcome the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. That one day he is going to solve all our problems, foreign and domestic, when he returns. Amen? That's huge for us to know. And the darkness hasn't overcome it. The light is still there, and the choice of light and life is still there for us. We see Jesus came to be and to bring light into our ever sin-darkened world. The study of light and darkness in the Bible is really striking. Um, the more I did this, the more I thought, I'm going to have to do a whole series on this. The word for light in the Old Testament in Hebrew is or. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says in Genesis uh, 1, 3, and God said, let there be or. Now, it doesn't say he created or light. He said, let there be light. I believe the light shone in heaven. I believe the second person of the Trinity the Son, who became Jesus at his incarnation. God says, let that be translated into our world. Let that break in. Let that pierce the darkness. And so the light comes. And then on uh, later it says, and he created the sun to rule the day and the moon to look over the night. And that was what was created. The Old Testament has all kinds of allusions to light and the darkness. In Psalm 18, verse 28, it says, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. And that, of course, is, is spiritual. In Psalm 112, 4, it says, even in darkness, light dawns on the upright for a gracious and compassionate and a righteous man. And so those of us who seek the light will find the light and he will find us. In Isaiah 1, 9, and 2, 9, 1 and 2, that we often read at Christmas time, but it's good for any time. It says, those dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And then in Isaiah 49, 6, it tells us that God has said that Israel was to be a light to the Gentiles. One of my favorite uh, verses is Ephesians 5, 8. And it says, for you who were once darkness, and that's all of us, we were all born in this darkness, for you who were once darkness are now light in the Lord. Live as children of light. There's deliverance in Jesus. Jesus' simple statement in John 8, and we're going to center our thoughts between John 8 and 12 today, if you have your Bible and, um, your, uh, or your device on which your Bible is these days. In John 8, 12, now this is kind of important because as you remember, there is an interpolation of a Jesus story uh, of the woman taken in adultery. And it kind of breaks up chapter 7 uh, and 8. But what we need to realize is that chapter 8 is still going from chapter 7. And it is the Feast of Tabernacles. In Hebrew, um, that Feast of Tabernacles is called a lot of things. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Uh, the Bible tells us uh, that Jesus, uh, the light came into the world, uh, and the word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and that word is tabernacle. It's kind of interesting. He, he came in temporarily to bring light into the world. And um, this is the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. It's called the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, in Hebrew, it's called Sukkot, and it just means shelters. And people would leave their homes, and they would build little lean-tunes. If you've ever lived in a Jewish area, you'll see these go up right around sometime in September. And people will build these little um, uh, shelters in their backyard. And the kids will do artwork, and people will come over, and they'll have their meals in there. And it symbolizes, it's for eight days, and it symbolizes that God had, had the children of Israel live in this transient way, not having homes, but just having temporary shelters for 40 years. Now, when they would have this feast in Jerusalem, in the court of the women, and I find that fascinating because anybody could go into the court of the women. It was open to everyone. And that tells us that the gospel is open to everyone. And in the court of the women, they made menorahs. And if you uh, flip your page over, there's a menorah on there. And uh, they would make these 75-foot menorahs by the temple wall in the court. And there was a walkway, and they would go up on the walkway, and they would light them. Four of them, 75 feet. I mean, you think of, this is, you know, 2,000 and a little more years ago, uh, the, the Herod's Temple. And you start to go, wow. And people living miles away could see this. And then this is the audacity that Jesus had. Because... In chapter 8, this is still going on. It says in chapter uh, 7, after this, Jesus went to Galilee. And um, uh, this was when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. And it goes all the way. And so these menorahs have been lit probably right at sundown. And it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Now think about that. There's four 75-foot menorahs. In each direction, east, west, north, and south. And there's a tiny human being standing there, probably on some kind of rise or step. And he says, don't worry about these 75-foot structures. I'm the light of the world. Now think about that. You're either a liar, you're a lunatic, or you're the Lord. And it's true. And 2,000 years later, we say, it's true. He's still a light of the world. He still shines in us. But this is stunning in its power and its simplicity. And the word light is a key word in a book written by the Apostle John, which is the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, in the book of Revelation. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is false. He is light. And in him is no scotia darkness at all, and those two words become a wonderful theme in the scriptures of the victory of light over darkness. I want us to read together 1 Peter 2.9, because Peter, the apostle, who had his own battles with darkness, he gets it. 1, 2, 3. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that is who we are today, and it's who Jesus is. And so I want to just talk to you a little bit about that. First of all, in this study of light and darkness, and Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. He says it at two holidays. He says it at the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, and he says it at Passover. And in the midst of a healing where he takes a man out of the darkness of blindness and gives him light, he talks about it as well. There is a diagnosis of poverty. In Romans chapter 1, which is the gospel of God, that's the theme of the book of Romans. In Romans 1.21, it says, For although they knew God, at one time human beings understood who God was, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their foolish 
minds and thinking became futile, and their hearts were darkened. There's that word for fear. Wow. And so we look there, and they are darkened. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, we studied that just a few weeks ago. It says, the God of this age has blinded their minds so they cannot see the light. That's the diagnosis that we have. The Bible is clear that there has been an invasion that has changed the original direction and nature of humankind. The world is a beautiful place. I heard some of our folks talking about going up to the, to the dunes. Uh, my wife and I, our, our kids live in south central Ohio, and they took us on a trip. We're, we're hoping to get a, a cabin with them sometime, but we, uh, we went on a trip and a drive through, through a place called Hocking Hills, if you've ever been there. It's just gorgeous, and it just stuns you. Some of our people uh, have been out west to um, some of the great, uh, uh, the great national parks, and just all of these different beautiful sights uh, in the world uh, are, are amazing. Some of them we don't know. A friend of mine and I were one time down in Nicaragua helping to, to, to set up a, a school corporation. And one day we took off from being with the lawyers. lawyers. Lawyers, I just want you to know, lawyers in any culture, in any language they speak, will still drive you nuts. So we had to take off a day, and we went to this huge volcano, and it was wonderful. And then we went down, and there was this waterfall, and it was just like majestic. And sometimes just sitting here in Whitley County on your back porch, the sunsets are stunning. The world is a beautiful place, and yet something's wrong. Something's wrong. Humans were created in the image and likeness of God, but something's wrong. We have the opportunity to live in wealth, and yet we set our cities on fire, and something is wrong. Now, it's really acknowledging an illness that can begin our healing journey. Jesus is our diagnostician. That means he's the one who tells us, he's the doctor who tells us what's wrong with us. We all need Dr. Jesus. You get that? We need Dr. Jesus. Have you ever gone to a doctor and told him what's wrong with you? I remember I was probably in my 30s, and I went to this doctor, and I came in, and I said, I'm here because this is wrong with me. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, what's your line of work? And I said, well, I'm a minister. And he said, what was your major in? I said, Greek and Hebrew. He said, you stick to Greek and Hebrew. What medical school did you go to? And it turned out it wasn't what I thought it was, you know, at all. And sometimes we're like that. Sometimes we think injustice is our problem, but it isn't. Sometimes we think that some people who have less money and others who have more, that that's our problem, and it isn't. Sometimes we think that it's an, an issue with, um, you know, with world peace. And it really isn't. Those are all symptoms. Our issue is sin. It's a small, three-letter word. But it is selfishness and it is sin. And it is that we have shaken our fist in the face of God we do it individually, and we do it corporately as nations and peoples. And when we really get help is when we acknowledge what our problem is. Um, my problems early in life uh, were alcohol-related. I, I don't talk about it a lot, but I, I don't shy away from it. But it's very interesting because I remember AA meetings. And I remember it's very interesting. You go to an AA meeting, and you never give your last name. And if you're visiting for the first time, or perhaps you're in a city and you just want to take in a meeting, you say, hello, my name is Steve, and I'm an alcoholic. And they say, hello, Steve. And, you know, basically it's saying, we are too. And that's how we can get help. Because we start to acknowledge what our problem is. In our world, we need to acknowledge that the problem is we have an absence of light. We need light. We need the light of Jesus in our world. And Dr. Jesus tells us what the problem is. And he says it three times in John that we're going to look at. Twice 
in connection with holidays and once in connection with the healing. And he says, I can fix you. Secondly, darkness has made us prisoners. And we see that in John 3.19. Now, when I was in college, most of us, we, we had, um, our classes were all done by about one in the afternoon, which was really nice for being able to work. And so they worked it that way, and we would get up early. And I had some friends uh, that worked really strange hours. Uh, many worked at UPS. Others worked at some other places. And one day I came in. My uh, roommate's name was Frank. He might even be watching today. Hello, Frank, uh, out, in, uh, out in Portland, Oregon. And I flipped the lights on, and he said, Bone. Now, you can laugh if you want to. Okay, that was my nickname in those days. And he said, Bone. He said, Shut off the light. Men love darkness rather than light. Well, that's true, and it was funny at the time. But if you read John 3.19, it says this is the verdict. This is the bottom line. You can't argue with this. That light has come into the world through Jesus, but men have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They'd rather say we can fix our problem than we can't fix our problem and here's who can. That has always been our problem. Sin plunged humankind into darkness and the solution is not hard. It was hard, you know, back in the Wabash days when they had to, you know, put these huge lamps up and run wiring and have a steam engine in the base. It's not hard now. You just come in, don't you, and you flip the lights on. That's what you need to do with Jesus. Flip the lights on. Let Jesus flip the light on for you. If I was going to name this um, another uh, title, I was going to name it, you remember, uh, the Motel 6 commercial, Tom Bodette will leave the light on for you. I have on the sign out there, he'll leave the light on for you. He still does. God planned redemption and the giving of light through the Jews in uh, Isaiah 49, 6 that I've alluded to. It says, he says, is it a too small a thing for you to be my servant, Jacob? to restore your tribe and bring back those of Israel that I have kept because they were going to be dispersed, but he was going to bring them back to show the world that there was something marvelous going on. I will also make you a light, an oar for the Gentiles that you, they may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Jesus comes through Israel. After the fall, humans were incarcerated in the darkness. In John 3, 19 to 21 that we've read, we see that we're comfortable in the darkness. Men love darkness rather than light. It covers our deeds. We remain unconfronted in the darkness. We can do things in the darkness that we can't do in the daylight. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 to 8, I believe that Paul alludes to this. And it says, but you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should not surprise you like a thief. He says, I'm coming again, and you're looking for it. You're looking to the light. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day, children of the day. We do not belong to the night. Or to darkness. So then let us not be like others. Boy, that's huge. Let us not. Why do we gather together so we're not like others? Let us not be like others who are asleep. But let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. They sleep in the darkness. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Isn't that the truth? That most bad things happen at night. Now, those of you who have, especially sons, because uh, they're dumber. I'll just let you know that, okay? I was a son, you know. Um, you've had this conversation with them when they're somewhere between 18 and 20. I had this conversation with Avery. And I said, very little good happens after midnight. So don't be around after midnight. Be where you're supposed to be. No policeman ever calls a parent at one in the morning to tell you what a fine, upstanding son you have. Now, they might tell you at eight in the morning when you stop by, you know, you stop by a shop and, a, and the uh, policeman's in there and say, yeah, I saw your son the other day, wonderful boy. They don't tell you that at two in the morning. There are problems at two in the morning. Are you with me? Very little good happens at midnight. 
And some of you, you need to, you need to listen to that one. Now, what's interesting is that God wants us to dwell in the light. And deliverance is pictured. In John 8, 12, that we've already alluded to, and Jesus and those four menorahs, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness and will have the light of life. And man, the religious leaders go nuts because they think they have a better idea. Our world thinks it has a better idea, and I'm here to tell you it doesn't. And then in chapter 9, as Jesus is just about to do a miracle, Jesus knows exactly what he's going to do to take this man from the darkness of blindness into light. And it says, he went along and saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, we, we talked about this during uh, our series on the miracles of Jesus and John, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither this man or his parents sinned, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it's day, as long as the lights are on, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I can fix this guy. And then when Jesus rises from the dead and sends his spirit into believers, he can do this again. He's still the light of the world, and he works through us. Jesus states that at both holidays and tabernacles and this healing, and then over in chapter 12, is um, in 12.1, it says six days before the Passover. So this is the Passover. It, it is when Israel becomes a nation. And they celebrate it. In verse 46, he says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me has to stay in darkness. And that's true today. If you're here today, you don't have to stay in darkness. You can have the light. The light can shine in your heart. The light can change you. The light can dispel the darkness. The light can propel you out to be more than you ever thought that you could be. Are you with me? Nobody's with me. Are you with me? Yeah, this is huge for us to understand. Because this is our destiny. He's the light of the world. He brings light. He saves people so they can gather together to give light to others. That's why we're here. Jesus declares in the court of the women that he is the light of the world. And the symbolism in all three statements, in both holidays and in the healing, is striking. Peter declares that G what Jesus came to do. He came to take us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And near the Passover, the last Passover that he'll celebrate before his death, burial, and resurrection, he reveals what his purpose is. And in verse uh, 44, he says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Boy, we see that in our world today, don't we? For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and a father of it. Yet because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty? And then he says, the reason you do not hear is that you don't believe in God. You don't understand the light. As we progress toward ultimate victory over light, over darkness, we're to walk in the light. The Bible tells us, walk in the light as he is in the light. When I was in seminary, um, I had a little church for several months, maybe a year, year and a half, uh, over on the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, a little place called Furlock, Maryland. And one, uh, and I, I, I would go there a lot of times on a Friday or Saturday, stay through till Monday. One night, I was coming home, uh, and um, I don't know, I got off on the wrong road. I really don't know how. And... Um, I realized I was on the wrong road, and I began to back up, and I felt that unmistakable, terrible feeling of sinking into a ditch. You ever been there? And I looked up, and I was by this little church that I knew. I heard wonderful things about the pastor, not met him, African American, largely African-American church. They called him Bishop. And I noticed there was a light on in his home across from the church. And so I went up, and I knocked on the door, and I explained who I was and what had happened. And I knew he'd been a farmer, and he just laughed. He was a big, jolly guy, and he slapped me and said, you come to the right place, brother. I got all kinds of chains. And he hooked me up and puffed out with this uh, old John Deere and pulled me out of the ditch. And, uh, you know, it was late, and so um, uh, I went home. And a couple weeks later, after our evening service, our evening service was earlier, 
and their evening service was a little later and longer. And um, I decided just to stop by, and I had a card for him and a little gift. And uh, he saw me come in the back door, and he said, Brother Johnson, come on up. And I really didn't want to be pointed out. Um, I'll just say it this way. I was a light bulb in that congregation, if you understand what I mean. And they were just great to me. They were just wonderful. And uh, he had me come up and sit on a, a bench with him and greet, greet the people. And he told me, he said, I pulled Brother Johnson out of a ditch the other day. And we laughed, you know. And uh, he leaned over to me as we were singing. And he said, you see that brother at the piano? And he was about 80 years old, white hair. And he was blind. It was very obvious he was blind. And he said, he writes all our music, and you won't know any of it. And I said, okay. But 40 years later, I remember a song that the old man began to play. And as he began to play it, man, everybody stood up, and they just started to, they started to move. So let us walk in the light as he is in the light whether at daytime or whether at night. So let us walk in the light as he is in the light. Jesus, the light of the Lord. And man, that just crescendo. They sang that thing for 10 minutes. And it's still true. I remember it 45 years away, 40 years later. You see, discipleship shows his power. Matthew 5, 14 to 16 says, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. See, he said, I'm the light of the world, but he says to us who know him, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. We need to be a city set on a hill, amen? That's why we go outside the doors on Labor Day weekend, so we can be a city set on a hill. Ephesians 5, 8 says he's taken us out of darkness and wants us to live in his marvelous light. Psalm 27, 1 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Light dispels the darkness in the heavens and in your life. As light has dawned in your life, it should increase. And we can become outward with light and fearless with light. This is done with others who are a part of his army of light and life. We need to be a torch so that it lights up the darkness and we pass it on to others and walk in the light. We progress towards ultimate victory. In Isaiah 60, verses 19 and 20, as I close here, as well as in the book of Revelation 21, 23, it tells us that there is coming a day when we will need no created light. We will only need the uncreated light of Christ. And in chapter 60, verses 19 and 20 of uh, Isaiah, he says, the sun in the kingdom age, the sun will no longer be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will wane no more. And in Revelation 21, speaking of the coming of Christ in the kingdom age, it says, the city... The new Jerusalem does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its light. And the Lamb is your light today, if you'll let him be. And so I say to you today, be forgiven. Don't leave this place without being forgiven. Without saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and into my life and wash my sins away. Because he will. Be fearless. Be fearless with your light. Because nobody can put it out. And be looking and longing for the future. C.S. Lewis had a great quote that I read this week. Where except in uncreated light, the light that has always shone in heaven, can darkness be drowned? So we need to access that light, and it needs to shine out from us. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, we come into your presence. We're thankful for the Wabash effect, <laughs> Lord, that we can light up the darkness with a light that never ceases. We thank you for Jesus. We'd ask, Father, you continue to help us be the light. And, Lord, I pray if there's anybody here today that's never been forgiven, that they would say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and into my life and wash my sins away and save me. Turn my darkness into light, and we know that you will. And we pray, Father, we would be fearless and that we would be looking to the future. In Jesus' name, and all of his children said, the altar's open. Stand with us as we close this morning.
the light of life. He's the everlasting day. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Help us to be the light of the world in Jesus' name. And all of his children said, amen. Just a couple of uh, things uh, today, this week, um, uh, we are getting things together for Miami Village. Um, so next week, we don't meet here, okay? We meet at Miami Village at 11. You can bring lawn chairs. Um, we do have 150 chairs rented. We're really making a push for folks from the park to come to our worship. Um, there's no problem getting them there for the food. Um, worship's a little more difficult. Um, so remember that in your uh, prayers. Um, if you can help with games, um, let me know. That can be very helpful. That's the one area. If you, are, uh, if you have signed up and are helping or know that you're helping, even if you haven't signed up, and you need any questions um, answered from me, uh, just see me uh, today. And I'm going to be getting in touch with people through uh, the week. But if you need to talk to me, please call me uh, or please see me after uh, church. And if you have a shirt, an Oak Grove shirt, uh, try to wear that next week. You don't have to, but if you have one, that would uh, be great. Also, September 27th is going to be the dedication of our playground and park. So it's been a long time coming, but it looks wonderful if you've been there. The fence is up now, and it's really exciting. Um, I have a special friend that is going to be uh, preaching the dedication. His name is Trevor Lane. Trevor is, I think, 21. Uh, he was born with cerebral palsy. He is a champion wrestler, and he has uh, gone to school in Ohio uh, for ministry, and he has a ministry already called, um, I think it's called I gotta, God's Abilities. I was saying his abilities. It's God's Abilities, and he's going to be wonderful uh, to be with us. Um, I think that's really all of the announcements that I need to make. Um, there were, at least at the uh, uh, beginning of this service, tomatoes in the back foyer that people have brought in if anybody wants them. You notice that I tell you that after service, so that if you don't like something I say, you don't have ammunition to throw at me, you know, so that's good. Be the light of life in your world today. Amen.